Detroit. Hello, everybody. What's up, Detroit? Yes, I'd like to welcome you to the life and times of Detroit hip hop. And uh, we got a great panel on the way today. I am your moderator, Nick Speed. Um, and we're going to let everybody introduce themselves. Which you first? Okay, well. I'll start, uh, I'll start it off. Uh, my name is Nick Speed. I'm a platinum music producer from Detroit. Um, you know, I got my big break working with 50 Cent on Get Rich or Die Trying soundtrack back in 2005. And uh, my first song went platinum in about a week. <laughs> it started from down the street. You know what I mean? Right where I recorded it in Midtown, second and seven. And um, ever since then, I started producing artists such as Danny Brown, Tyler Kweli, Snoop Dogg. Uh, the entire Shady G Unit Aftermath, um, and just about everybody in Detroit. My current project is Decipher. It's in the Detroit Institute of Arts. I did the entire music score for that exhibit. So when you walk into the DeSalle Gallery in the Detroit Institute of Arts, you'll see pictures of 81 pictures of all types of people from Detroit hip hop, in which I was a co-curator as well as uh, doing all the music. So. I put 39 songs together just for you when you walk into the gallery. But, um, you know, enough about me. You're going to go straight to my left. Tell them who you are. Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Gessica. I'm an artist um, out of Detroit, Michigan, Eastside. I'm also a cultural ambassador for the United States Department. Um, I, I do cultural diplomacy through hip hop. And I'll be performing at Smithsonian in October, October 14th, to be exact. And hopefully you come check me out here in the area. And I also do um, activism work. I'm also a teacher. I also teach a workshop in Title Tennis, speaking my mind of speech. And um, I'm just glad to be here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lee Ferrison. Uh, I'm an artist here I'm from Detroit. Uh, I'm, uh, I would say put out about a 10 to 12 projects in the past 15 years. Uh, on the MC, I have a band called Best Friendly. Workshops in church, hip hop workshop for kids, uh, Mount Palooza, the Medical Music Festival. Uh, but I'm honored to be here and uh, meet you uh, after the exhibition today. Thank you. Right. Uh, my name is Yakuza Moon. I uh, <laughs> I feel like I got a flex, like I got a flex in between, you feel me? Um, no, nah, but um, I'm, a, I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm from Detroit, I'm a published writer, uh, part of the style literary arts. Uh, Coalition. I'm an internationally uh, recognized slam poet. I'm um, part of the National Slam Team in Detroit. I'm an MC. I've been uh, rapping for most of my life. I got a, a couple, uh, couple projects out right now. It's just like some real underground stuff. And I'm uh, currently working on my, my, my major debut. Um, so we yeah, I'm just working. Well, first before I say who I am, I just want to say thank you to Nick Speed because my name is Lamar Hayes. Um, and the reason why I thanked him is because I'm actually in that exhibit in the oh. PIA across the street. Oh, sweet. And I've never seen it. Oh, wow. So I just want to let you know that there are people around the world wow. that have called me. Because as I said before, I am uh, a native of Detroit. I do live in, in New Jersey, but I work in New York City now. Um, I do uh, marketing and promotional work for various you know, record companies and other lifestyle accounts. Um, I've done that probably for the past 25 years. I've probably worked for every major record company that there have been. Actually, the young man just told me he was at my house, what, 15, 20 years ago? Man, I was here in 97. I was just remember, you know, but um, I've been at this thing a long time. And I think that, you know, when I found out about this, it was really cool and very important for me to get on a plane to come, you know, spend an afternoon with you guys. And also, again, to see the exhibition as well, because I got a phone call and they said, get on a plane, I said, okay, I'm here, and I took a picture, and I had no idea what it was right. at the time, Right. and, you know, so again, you know, congratulations oh, to man. you, and even I told, is this yeah. Jenny? Yeah, Jenny Richard. Jenny, that, yeah. that was amazing. Oh, man. Amazing. Incredible. So, really cool to spend, you know, the afternoon with you guys, and, and, and learn a lot about what's going on with this evolution that's going on here in the city, and, and, and there are a lot of people outside of the city that have roots here that do come in from time to time to help and, and, and be a part of what's going on. Um, so that's pretty much about it. What's up, everybody? Uh, I'm DJ Lowe's. I'm probably the grandpa. 
know everybody up here. <laughs> 45 years old. Um, I've been in the hip hop game as far as uh, the Detroit scene since like 1987. Uh, I was part of a rap group called uh, Easy B and DJ Lowe's. We had the first full length rap album in Detroit. Um, my dad is like a, um, a master percussionist. Um, that's how I got in the game. My dad played percussion in Parliament, Monkadelli. Boosie um, Rubber Band, uh, Zap, The Dramatics, with Franklin, and Mariah Carey. I mean, the list goes on. My dad is my hero. Um, and that's how I got in it. I was actually, the first the first time I recorded was on a Boosie Collins album in 1979 called uh, The Juicy Wave Home, and I had both credits and uh, as well as percussion credits um, at seven years old. So um, that was my introduction to it. Um, uh, 1994, I had a song on the Above the Boom soundtrack. Uh, that's the movie uh, that Tupac was in. Uh, um, that, that record was on Death Row Records. Um, the name of the song was My Money Right. Uh, featured an MC by the name of uh, uh, Lord G. Lord G rapped over one of, one of my tracks. I got a platinum plaque, multi platinum plaque from that. Um, uh, man, I've done so much stuff in the community here in Detroit. That's good, that's good right there. So um, make a round of applause for the for the panel right there. For sure. I wanna start off by um, you know, I wanna kinda ask a little bit about you guys musical history because um, you know, me being a Detroit musician, like I went to Detroit public schools and I didn't necessarily have like music training, you know, um, like by the time I got, I was in school, like bands and everything was over. Like you know what I'm saying, the schools that I went to or whatever. So we never had a band or none of that at my schools. But um, you know, it's just funny that I became a musician. You know, basically learning by ear. You know, and you know from different family members and stuff like that, and just watching TV and everything. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, figure out uh, some of your musical DNA. You know what I mean, as far as like where you get your inspiration or. You know, for me, I would say it starts with my family. You know what I mean? I, I would say it starts with the music that was played in the house and basically the musical taste of my aunties, uncles, and, you know, stuff like that and whatever I heard on the block and then certain stuff I liked and then certain stuff I would see on TV and I would just, uh, you know, be like, wow, Nirvana is incredible. You know what I'm saying? Like, even though I was a hip-hop kid or um, Red Hot Chili Peppers and... Then when I was discovered, like, Jimi Hendrix music and stuff like that, you know, just different genres of music and stuff. Radiohead is my favorite band. So, you know, I get inspired by, like, a lot of different other kind of music other than, you know, maybe what somebody would expect with me being mostly a hip-hop, techno, R&B artist or whatever. So, you know, um, I just wanted to know. Thanks to me. 
you know what I'm saying? I gotta do something else. <laughs> you know, I gotta meet the other person. Thursday, but he said, no. He said, Dr. Gray already heard. He said, Snoop heard. He said, all my heard. He said, everybody said that has to go down. So that was my lesson that whenever you create something, like you said, treat it like it's your baby. You know what I'm saying? Because you never know what somebody else is going to like. You never know where it's going to take you. I still report to them. I think I got to work to check this maybe about a month ago. Well, I'm trying to get around to myself. It's a lunch on you. Nah, 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 it's a lunch on you. But you know what, though? I'm going to say this, too, is that what I've learned with creative people, and, and you, this, but this is universal, is the record that you don't think is it, or the creation of your art that you don't think is it, that's always the one. Mm -hmm. I used to work for, um, I used to, he's a Detroiter. I used to work for Barry Hanson, so I used to work at Black Ground Records, okay? So Barry, along, you know, I was there, you know, rest or so, whatever, you know, all that, whatever, but Barry Hankerson used to manage Tony Braxton, and I'll never forget, me and Tony Braxton were talking, and she talked about how, you know, because we kind of had that same discussion. Her biggest record is Unbreak My Heart that she's ever made, and that's the record that she said, I hate it. She said, I hate it every time I have to uh -huh. sing it, but that's her biggest, biggest success. And she said, I never thought that it would be in that record. So that seems to be something that's universal. So creative people, when it's the record, whatever it is you don't think is it, that's normally the one. Mm. And that's how it works. That's how it works. Okay, so um, for those that don't know, you know, like to me, uh, the music industry is kind of built on relationships. So, um, you know, and a lot of different industries actually are built on relationships. So, you know, with you guys being in a position of you've already you know, release music and stuff like that. And I'm sure there's like new artists that are either in the room or, you know, just in the world. Like what would actually, you know, get your attention for you to want to work with them? Like what type of traits, what type of, you know, things? Like is it like they do the kind of music I do or like they study my music or, you know, like this person does not stop working. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like what what is it that, uh, that makes you say, you know, this person is talented and special because talent, you know, Detroit has a lot of talent, but talent is actually rare. You know what I'm saying? Talent is a rare thing. Like, everybody's not just gifted and talented and able to just make music off the top of their head and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So, I'm just wondering, like, what are the traits of, like, you know, like if a new artist came up to you, you know, one of you guys and, uh, you know, they wanted to work with you, or maybe you see them and they don't even know you yet, but you're you're seeing something in them. Like what what makes you determine like that they're spectacular or special? It's, it's a certain sincerity okay. that I pick up on, and uh, I can tell somebody's passion. Like I can tell they love it. I can tell they um, actually have a calling for. It's very spiritual. This one right here. Uh, <laughs> this one. I remember walking into the Bible gathering. Yeah. And just standing on his shoulder, he's right and he didn't know I was standing on his shoulder. And I was listening to him recite. And I was listening to him recite the same you know, song over until he had it just right. It reminded me of what I like to do if anybody knows me, I go to this rock and I'm just meditating. I become very repetitive because I want everything perfect. I want to feel it. I'm committing things to memory. And that showed me a work that the bag had. Also show me that passion for something. And um, he almost seemed like a curious at his age. You know, and this is a few years ago. I don't know what else this is probably like three or four years. Yeah, three or four years ago. And just seeing that, it just first reminded me of myself, but it, it also reminded me that something is going to be greater than myself, but not already. So I, I see a lot of these young kids that get dismissed and they don't get celebrated because um, you do get older and you do have that different frequency. And we tend to um, discard uh, things that don't resonate with our frequency. But I think it's foolish because um, when we talk about the evolution of hip hop, when we talk about different artists that are perpetuating that evolution, we have to consider the youth. And when I saw them, I saw past, present, and future. And so that's what I look at in artists. So I see past, present, and future in me. Because that's what I'm hiding. When I talk about love and that's the when I talk about loving, that I do like, like a lot of artists. And I'm going to write whoever's next up because I just love music, so I'm looking for, I'm looking for that timeline, which, you know, to be uh, historically uh, influential. 
that we're looking forward to and how big of an influence will you be. And that's not just based on how popular you be, but just that passion. And um, having that same sincerity and passion strengthens relationships. Now, you can have the platinum albums, that's beautiful. We love them all that. But the world and having a good name for yourself, the good reputation, the good relationships will carry you further than anything. Half the calls that I've gotten have been just because I said, how are you today? And I, you, I just had you in my mind. They knew I was a great artist, so they appreciated my music. But when I would get those calls for those jobs that seemed out of reach, it's because somebody remembered that I thought of them on the day that they were feeling low or exceptionally bad for whatever reason. They, re they remembered that I took the time out of my day to wish them well. Let's see how you're doing. And that's the importance of establishing relationships because with relationships, you have influence as well. So when you think you might be counted out of a, 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 a job or something like that, somebody might be you because they know the person that you are, even more so than they know the quality of their music. So you want to keep the quality of your character up to par because people will remember that. They remember how you make them feel. That's, you know, it sounds cliche, but they will remember how firm the handshake was. They remember how deep their embrace was when you love them. They remember how genuinely smile was when you laugh with them. You feel like somebody's not sincere to you. That's universal. So that's that's my view of um, who I work with. Like even sitting here right now, I know who, I, who I'm going to talk to after this. You know, I'm just like, oh, you know. So it's it's, it's having those it's having those antenna for um, who get good character and who you want to line yourself up with because you have to be cautious with who you allow your energy and yourself up with because I'm telling you, you need that association. And you just as sweet as power, if you're not careful about who you embrace and who you allow to take up your space, you'll um it'll be put a deck in yourself. So be mindful of that. So I'm, I'm very recruiter. I love a lot of folk, but a lot of people hate me too. <laughs> 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 you know, I'll go back home after the show. <laughs> but I, I, I do that. I do that because, because you have to protect your energy, you have to protect your reputation, you have to protect your character. So those things I look for in artists, those people that reflect the same qualities of ethics and morale that I have. And um, you look at me as old as eight, as young as eight, and I'm going to gravitate toward that. And I'm going to um, hopefully work with you because of that. We got about five minutes left too, so if y'all can keep your answers down a little bit, because we gotta we gotta be done at uh, 355. I'm gonna keep running quick. Um, definitely sincerity, and I also look at willingness to grow. Um, quick example: um, someone was working on the uh, I forget which album, but I used to take by ten to the studio, and he wasn't in the group anymore. He, but I used to see the gentleman that's running the panel right here, and they speak. If I took 10 to the studio at 9 o'clock, they speak here. If I took them at 2 o'clock, they speak here. If I took them at 10 o'clock, damn, does Nick go wrong? <laughs> he was at the studio all the time just because he wanted people to hear his music. And I'm like, okay, this guy's really dope because it was his passion, his sincerity, and also his willingness to grow because there were other producers around, other MCs around. You know, Elsa was over here, T3 was over here. I think maybe Timberland may have been yeah. one time. So it's so like everybody was there. We haven't officially worked yet, but the first thing they said to me when I walked up to him today was, you got to come to the studio. So his willingness to grow, and I never forgot those conversations in over 15 years ago. So my brother, he worked. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel exactly um, how the essence felt about as far as you know collaboration goes. Uh, a lot of the looks I get are from things that people remember uh, me doing. You know, uh, back at the Five and Gallery, like she just said, um, whether it was just me writing or you know getting ready for a show or featuring or hosting, any literally any mundane thing. Um, and I would never think that it you know was so impactful. Like I'm getting looks off of three dilla days ago. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody was in the crowd and. and Felt it so for me, it's just a feeling I definitely feel it. Not only the sincerity, but just like the true love and uh, unconditional passion um, for the art form. And just in any way, it can be in the most, it can be in the smallest way, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it can be, it can be even a conversation as a collaboration for me. 
You know what I'm saying? Because the, the influence never stops and the, uh, the inspiration never stops. I think as artists, we spend a lot of time not creating art and waiting for, you know what I'm saying, inspiration or waiting for it to feel it. But it's like, I never not feel it uh, when there's so much love around you. You know, um, so yeah, that's how I feel about it. Okay, once again, I'm at a disadvantage because all this creative, <laughs> cool stuff. My bar's a little lower, and, and when I say that, I mean, I'm just about helping people from the D. To be very clear, it's almost as simple as that. You know, because sometimes my help could be just something simplistic as, um, and I just got through watching the full length the other day about the, uh, the story of the sugar man, right? Mm -hmm. The guy who was in Detroit, yeah, had no idea who he was, but if he just knew that if he would have spent $22, and had an ISIC code on all of his music, and the average person who creates music, they don't even know what that is. It 22 bucks. So no matter where it is on the planet, that's your identification for your record, for your music. So if any money is being generated, they know, okay, this is how we do it. So I think for me, it's about being a resource to my people from the D. And like I said, I'm up in New York City, so every day, and dealing with what it is that we do, and I, and I just look at, at, at people at home and that we don't have a lot of, just some of the resources as we could in terms of the information. You know, because just, just remember this, and, and I always say this, is that unfortunately, the music business is like a casino. It's designed for you not to win, not for you to make money. So you need to have someone who can try to help you modify some of those pitfalls. Like he said, he had, he had T. Green over there to help him with that paperwork, but right. a lot of people at the road didn't have it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people at the road had a really tough time because they didn't have somebody to help them navigate those waters. So, you know, so I guess we got to leave whoever I can help, especially if you're from the hometown, I got you. It's about as simple as that. So, that's what I can do. But I do have to protect my spirit. <laughs> at the 8 o'clock, my wife said, I got to go home and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. I look for, and like work on people, that was the question that we mm -hmm. I'm attracted to creativity. We just create people, you know what I'm saying? And, and setting up a professional, you know, sometimes that can uh, make or break whether or not I want to deal with you. If you're not professional, or if you have the ignorant, or you know what I'm saying, you're not focused, um, that tends to make me say, okay, this person, I'm not going to do this one time. Detroit hip hop. Make some noise, Detroit. And that's a wrap. Oh. You have a question? Towards her 
But the reality is that, you know, sometimes we just have records that just, you know, do what it is they do. Nobody sat back and said, this young lady who was an exotic dancer at one time and had this other life that got on this other show that I think is the most toxic thing to our youth today, which is love and hip hop, that she was going to find you, put on some clothes, have somebody else ride the track for her, and now she got another one ready. And she's going across the country, she picked it up bad, 75,000 over here. She's going to perform at the Vera Wayne, uh, New York Fashion Week over there, and make 300, and nobody didn't think that was going to happen. So I think people have to understand that if you want to be in that space, it's just about whatever sells and makes you money. Because at the end of the day, like I said before, Record companies are about making money. They're about market share. They're about making sure that stock price is okay on Wall Street. That's the real conversation. So Cardi B is helping the stock price at Atlantic, which is helping you know, their market share, which helps the finance movie, because they can give a care less, again, of some of the toxic images that are given to our people. And I'm going to say this too, and I know we got it coming. Mm -hmm. I wrote this little piece, one of my buddies in an in a urban magazine, he said he wanted me to write something. And I wrote this piece about the tale of two cities. And it was very similar to, to the book. To, uh, was it Charles Dick? No. Uh, it was Dick. Yeah. And I had no idea about, you know, what, you know, the 1800s, the aristocratic class, this class. It's the same thing. Because I always say that if you do your history, when they did certain things to our music, and they said, okay, Tyler, um, uh, Taylor Swift is going to give your music away, and what did Taylor say? No, you're not. But the, our music, you know, you can go on that to if it. You can do all of this, and I'm still trying to find a Garth Brooks mixtape I can download. <laughs> <laughs> I can find one. You know what I'm saying? So, I think, again, when you answer that, or ask that question, you've got to make sure and have an understanding of what genre of music you're talking about. Because they treat us totally different in the rap, urban, soul space, historically, than what they've done in the country, rock and roll space. It takes up us out there. And I know we got to go. So we used to have this thing called Napster. When you came to my house, he said, I did it. So I don't know if you know this, but I didn't either. So, Napster, you had all of these soldier born you we had all of these urban artists that was just flourishing. There was this group called Shoot. I'm gonna mess this up. It wasn't a slayer, it was a big rock group. I forgot. Metallica. Metallica. Mm -hmm. So Metallica had the same lawyer as Dr. Dre. A lot of people don't know that. Metallica came out with a record. It got on Napster, but Tyler said, oh, no, 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 <laughs> they filed a lawsuit. If you go back and look at the lawsuit and you read it, Dr. Trey's name on there because they had to say attorney. Jimmy, uh, them, all of them was like, oh, we're about to shut this down. Boop, boop, boop. But that was until after the fact, after we had been exploited and all our stuff had been devalued. It's just like, you know, I don't know who smokes weed, but you put too much weed out there, the price of weed going to go down, right? That's what they do with our music. It's about devaluing. It's also about, and I know I'm ready to get booed and get out of here, because I, I read this the other day, because I'm still pissed off about that arena over there. Oh, yeah. So I read in the arena that this family devalued that property for 15 years. Yeah. 15 years. It's all about the devaluation. So we have to be careful in, in terms of, and I, I know I'm taking too long. It's, 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 we need this information. It's, it's almost cocktail time, right? We'll be some in a minute. <laughs> so I think if you learn to understand that, and with certain people that, 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 that I work with and I deal with, we just had this conversation, if you understand some of these pitfalls and how it's designed for you not to win, then you know how to modify and do what you need to do in order to win. Because I'm still trying to figure out how can you take money from a because I checked into the foundation house, room, whatever that is over there. Oh, my bill, I, I'm paying for that stadium too, and I don't live here per se, right? It's a tax over there. I'm still trying to figure out, because I went to a little private party, and I'm eating the little pate, and the little caviar, it's everything that right? <laughs> yeah. Y'all can't find one Detroit-based company to work in here? Mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So the head, so when we, and so the, the whole kid rocking all the other shenanigans, because I know Jay coming in November, I get it, I know that support the pitch, but I'm trying to figure out how are we going to spend money in the building that that property had been devalued, and now all of a sudden the value of goes up, you go take my money, because my mom still lives here, but grandma is <coughs> for all of that. So I'm still paying too, so even though I don't live here, I'm trying to process all of this. So this is part of the understanding of what they're looking for, which is the same battles and stuff that are going on that we deal with every day when we roll up in here. When you roll up eight mile, you don't know, appear to whatever it is. So again, if you have this understanding, then it helps. It helps you navigate because you still can make money, but you have to be careful. You have to make sure that you understand certain things have to be done properly. Again, some simplicity is having the ISRC code of any record that you do. And most artists don't even know what the hell that is. And it's $22. And they up in, uh, I don't even know the names anymore, Erotic City, uh, yeah. they up in the club, popping the bottle, you know, but they don't spend the $22 to have an ISRC code. Sure. So, that's my thing. So again, since if I can help you, I got you, it's all good. Like, like, uh, I think just to add on, like, maybe like BDI, BDS and all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, you're talking about the beat is free to submit yeah. so you know what you I mean, like, there's a lot of people, just to add on real quick, there's a lot of people that, like, missed out on some hits because they didn't have their paperwork correct, like, when, you know, um, no names, no names, but it was like certain songs that I know for sure came out and got, like, major Detroit play. And then, like, you know, you would think somebody was going to get a deal off of it, like, just how many spins they got in the Midwest and everything, but they, it wasn't counting because they didn't have it BDS uh, registered and stuff like that. So when they went to the label, like, man, we're the hottest thing in the Midwest, and they're like, where? Yeah, KC. And, and, and as there's this too, and we're going to leave, it's a company called Sound Exchange. A lot of people have no idea that this is a non-profit organization in Washington, D.C. And even though you go to ASCAP, VMI, and CSAC, they collect royalties for your digital, all the digital outlets or things that are done all over the world. And another thing too, now they just got this past the Congress where if you're on jail being at the club, but they're broadcasting online, now they got to pay. So that's their job to collect that money. Most artists, like right now, I talked to my man the other day, they got about $600 million to sit in the bag mm. because the artists won't come get it. Because it's, it's an artist's royalty. It's not for the producer or anybody else. It's directly for the artist. So if you don't go over there and say, hey, I'm such and such, do you all have any money? Because like for the past couple of years, a lot of big people, they had no idea they had big checks sitting over there. So again, if that's another little resource. Just those two little things. Because it's about, if you're an artist, you gotta understand you, you're a little small business. So part of your business is to figure out how you can get these different you know, streams of income coming to your business. So if you can't spend twenty two dollars or sign up for sign exchange for free, then what are we doing? And that's what I mean when you talk about protecting your spirit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm trying to be better with the bad words, but if you got a blankety blank blank that won't do that, then you know, I'd have did the best that I could for you to tell you, you know, just fill out the paper, bro. It's twenty two dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's it. All right, man. Go. All right. Thank you to the panel, thank you, Detroit. We appreciate you. No doubt. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah.